Good afternoon, everyone. I think for once, at least in the United States, we are in the afternoon for everybody, unless maybe you're in Hawaii, so lucky you. Um, and maybe unluckiest among all is Ann Vandenhoek, who has very kindly uh, agreed to join us from her spot way across the pond where it is now 10 p.m. at night. Um, Ann is a, a chaplain, a chaplain researcher, a professor theology, so wearing lots of different hats that she takes on and off at various times. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us, Anne, um, and spending some valuable time with us. You're welcome. Glad to be here, although indeed it is 10 p.m. at night. <laughs> <laughs> and we are very, very grateful for that. Let me start by asking, um, you know, you are in a very different setting from most of the people that are watching this webinar. How did you end up doing the work that you're doing? The work that I'm doing now as a researcher slash professor? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I started out as a chaplain and um, had a, still have a vocation for that um, profession. And uh, I worked for about um, 14 years in chaplaincy. I did my CPE in San Francisco in UCSF and I did my, well, I did some research and uh, I was the chaplain on the cardiac floors in Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri for about a year, if I remember well. And then after 14 years of chaplaincy, I did my PhD on outcome oriented chaplaincy in 2007. Mm -hmm. And um, then hung on to be a supervisor and a trainer in chaplaincy and then eventually became a professor of pastoral care and spiritual care um, at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. Beautiful place. You should all visit. <laughs> well, of, of course, I think we would all... We would all love to visit at some point. We have uh, guests that are coming from so many different places. And it's funny, you know, you, you, are, you are where you are now, but you did training in San Francisco, Missouri. Uh, if we think about stereotypes, you have seen sort of everything the United States has to offer. <laughs> and exactly. I think I, there was a huge difference between the, the West Coast, the East Coast, and the Midwest, let me tell you. And, it, and that's, I think, you know, brings us, to the topic of tonight, because I, I was kind of shocked in the beginning mm. uh, between the culture that I experienced in my hospital, which is the university hospital here in Leuven, where I worked for uh, 10 years, and the culture even in San Francisco and certainly in the Midwest, <laughs> because, you know, you talk so much about God and we <laughs> don't. And people say, yeah, but, you know, a God, God talk is cultural and that's, there's not, not necessarily something behind. But the fact that there is God talk was to me such a shock. I still remember vividly, for example, um, uh, uh, visiting a patient. And I thought I was in the room alone with the patient, but there was also a cleaning lady cleaning in the bathroom who I didn't see. And I was talking to a patient. He told me something about his life. And I said, wow, that is amazing. That happened to you. And from the bathroom, there was the cleaning lady say, that's God's way of working for you. And I was like, what? This would never have happened to me in Belgium or you know, sometimes I had a feeling that I had to run as a chaplain in St. Louis to be the first to be able to pray with a patient because otherwise the doctor or the nurse would have prayed before me. And I was like, why am I here? You know, that would never ever happen in Belgium or a doctor is saying to me, you know, yesterday night I came to this patient, she's not conscious and she was not at ease. So I, I started reading the, the Psalms to her and I noticed that it had a calming effect on her. And I came to Psalm 10 before I got called to another patient. Can you continue today? That was the point where I called my team in the university hospital and said, I'm living in a parallel universe. <laughs> this was something that would never ever happened 
in my or happen in my uh, hospital. So there is a cultural difference. Um, but yeah. now you're confronted with secularism too. So I'm I'm curious too. Well, and I, I think that if I had to guess, of course, we don't ask folks, what's your motivation for signing up for this webinar? But I think that that's why it's so interesting. Um, we can't predict the future. Uh, I think that we can all comfortably concede that. But if you look at the trends in the United States, rates of formal religious affiliation, self-identification, those are on the decline. That does Spirituality is necessarily going anywhere, but certainly folks who say that I belong to X, Y, or Z denomination, tradition, congregation, whatever, that's on the decline. I think that some folks like to look at Europe and say, well, that's the future for us. And maybe that, maybe that is the case. I think there probably is more, more in play here. I think that the cultural differences are quite a bit different. We can't just say that well, Europe now is what the U.S. is going to look like in 50 or 100 years. But all of that is to say there is a very clear difference. Um, you are at the Catholic University uh, there in Belgium. Belgium, historically, a very Catholic country. And now you would say probably not. What is it like to work as a chaplain in a society that would consider itself uh, secular in some kind of generic sense of the word, but with a very strong, I guess, memory of, of religion? It's not always easy, but it's also uh, challenging and it's enriching mm -hmm. and it's um, renewing and it's many things. It's not only negative because I think um, I speak for myself, but also for other chaplains. There is, there is also a kind of grieving among us that the context is no longer the context we studied in or we had our vocation in or and I speak then for my generation mm -hmm. and and older but on the other side there is also a kind of eagerness to learn how spirituality is manifesting itself now in people apart from institutions right. so um, another thing I want to add to your question when you're telling me about, um, you know, look at Europe, we will be like Europe in 10 or 15 years. Um, what is Europe? I mean, it's, it's 27 states, well, 26 now, sorry. I'm still <laughs> grieving that too. Um, uh, but uh, it's 26 countries with a huge difference in chaplaincy among each other because of cultural, religious mm -hmm. history and diversity. Um, there are huge differences among the countries. So, and still also regarding uh, secularism. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, you can't say like Europe is one, is secularized in the same way, no. I think um, sometimes I get upset when people from the Netherlands, for example, say, well, you be like us. In, in five years, and I'm like, no, we'll not be like you, we'll do it in our own way because we have a different culture and a different history and we have different ways of expressing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that is something to keep in memory if we're talking about Europe. You still have countries where there is no separation between state and religion, mm -hmm. like in Greece, where 90% of the people are Greek Orthodox and where there is a very sacramental pastoral care also in hospitals and health institutions. And then you have countries like the Czech Republic, for example, which is so secularized, uh, where you know, the, the number of people who still believe in God is so small. So there are huge differences within a few thousands of kilometers. Yeah. So you can't say Europe as a whole. But um, I would say that, um, if I, if I could reflect a little bit on how does it make a difference to chaplains and mm -hmm. to their work, um, I would say it doesn't and it does. Um, it doesn't in a sense that um, if I speak for my country where 90% of the people used to be, used to identify themselves as Catholics and now only 50% of them do where three to four percent still goes to Mars every Sunday, mm -hmm. um, then 
when when 90 percent of the people were catholic then you could as a chaplain visit 10 people and maybe four or five of them were culture catholics mm -hmm. because there was a huge peer pressure to be catholic yeah. and everything was organized from you know the cradle to the grave uh, through the catholic church and so we still go to everyone um um, but now we just have to, you know, explore more how they express their spirituality. And that's maybe the biggest difference that is that we see that the language mm. to express spirituality is changing. It's no longer a religious language. It's no longer even an overtly spiritual language. Um, it's it it's it's different in a sense that it pops up now and then in different um, concepts. For example, let me give you an example. Um, we have legalized euthanasia in Belgium. So if people have experienced meaninglessness in life when they are ill and they're severely ill and they experience meaninglessness, whether they are mentally or physically ill, um, they will talk about euthanasia. They will say, I'm considering euthanasia. Uh, this has to stop. I, I don't want to be dependent on others. Uh, I, I don't think my life is worth living anymore. I want to die with dignity. And they start to talk about euthanasia. We have a term, a, even a name for that. We call it euthanasia talk. And euthanasia talk becomes an expression of um, verbalizing spiritual pain and meaninglessness. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you want to ask for euthanasia. It doesn't mean that you want to proceed with the procedure of euthanasia. It's the only language some people have at this point mm -hmm. to say that they are suffering on an existential or a spiritual level. Young people often use the language of feelings to talk about the spiritual. So, you, ha you know, you have the, the layer of facts that you go through as a chaplain, you have the layer of feelings, and then we say you have the layer of the spiritual and the existential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, they, they kind of circle in this layer of feelings, and it means that you're talking about meaning of life and transcendence in a language of feelings, feeling a part of something that is bigger than you. You know, it's it's kind of interesting how they talk, of, for example, they talk about fate uh, a lot. Young people talk about fate more and more. Um, not about faith, but fate. And uh, it, it's kind of interesting to explore the concepts that they are using as chaplains. It also, I think, demands from chaplains um, a, a more of a balancing act between mm. your own identity, your own faith identity, and the non-faith identity of, of the majority, um, which has its advantages and its disadvantages. It's not always easy to be in the midst of a tension but I think it's the most fruitful place to be because um, it gives you the tools to search for new ways of expressing meaning. And it also um, gives you the language that you can offer others to express uh, right. what, what they are feeling regarding spirituality. Right. Right. The, the issue of language, I think, is so, um, it's so pressing even for us because for a variety of reasons in, in the American context, we hear all the time that even the word chaplain is so highly loaded that it brings up a barrier in many cases um, yeah. for a, a hospital chaplain to come to the room and introduce themselves as the chaplain. Lots of folks say no. Um, because in their mind, a chaplain is someone who's going to 
read the Psalms to them or offer them communion or want to pray over them or whatever. Um, and of course, uh, professional chaplains are not going to do that, but we still have the language barrier there. Given everything that you just said about um, cultural identification with religion, um, engagement with spirituality on a level of feeling and existentialism, how have you seen chaplaincy as an institution adapt in your setting? Uh, you know, for instance, in your university hospital, has the spiritual care sort of unit changed its approach to staffing or where chaplains fit in? Uh, presumably, you know, 50 years ago, the chaplains would have been a regular part of the hospital that just kind of moved around like anybody else. But my impression is that maybe it's not the same today, but I don't know that. Um, good question. Um, there really is no unity again. There is no unity. For example, um, when I visited my colleagues in Portugal um, recently, they, they, they say, well, people still identify with a church, but they no longer go to the church. And we call that detraditionalization here. I don't know how to translate it in English, but um, it's kind of, you know, you, you grow further away from the traditions that you once belonged and you still value some aspects of it, but you don't, you no longer identify with all practices or with all teachings or with um, uh, everything that is said there. And they didn't know very well how to deal with it. Um, mm. And they didn't change anything. It's still priests and religious visiting and a sacramental pastoral care, but it is changing. Whereas in the Netherlands, for example, I think the, um, the clearest impact there is the fact that they train, hire chaplains who themselves do, no longer have a specific tradition. Mm -hmm. So they don't have, um, they're not humanist chaplains, they're not Buddhist chaplains, they're not uh, pandits, they're not Muslim chaplains, they're not Christian chaplains. They are, they are no long, longer identifying with one specific religious tradition. They're not a majority, um, um, but they, they do exist and they mostly have a previous different master degree in something else and then they follow a one-year training which is a generalist spiritual care kind mm -hmm. of uh, training and then they are hired um, there are advantages and disadvantages to that um, in a sense that i think that one of the advantages is that you can say well they represent part of the population who does the same um, they, they don't belong to a specific religious or, a, you know, I don't identify with a specific faith tradition anymore, whether it's a religion or it's humanism. But um, the disadvantage to me is then um, what is your identity? Because sometimes your identity is something that the patient is using as a mirror, as a stepping stone, as a confrontation, as a identification so there's the whole question surrounding that in our university hospital um, it didn't change the staffing but it does change the way the chaplains are working um, for example in the, um, in the um, pediatrics i think pediatrics is is one of the examples for that um, if, if we go individually uh, to rooms and introduce ourselves to parents and children, then, we ex then the, the experience is that it takes much longer to uh, go across, you know, this is what we do. It's spiritual care. We're not here to mm. convert you to represent um, a specific um, faith tradition that we want to push in your face. Right. Um, so it takes longer, whereas they organize an event where children and parents are participating, the visits afterwards are going 
uh, much easier and they go deeper sooner. For example, mm. uh, there is a, an event called light a candle where everyone can light a candle for themselves or for someone else in the hospital and uh, hundreds of people do that. When that event is organized and the chaplains organize that, then afterwards when the chaplain visits, it's like there is no threshold anymore right. and they can go directly to we're here for spiritual care right that's a peculiar event um on the other hand it ha it helps that chaplains are um open to do rituals that can go from very strict to what the faith tradition is saying to um we know that you're no longer part of a religious tradition, but we want to support you with a ritual in your saying goodbye. So, you know, what do you need for that ritual without, I think, selling yourself or becoming a chameleon? Um, because right. when, you know, it's, I think integrity and authenticity are very important in chaplaincy mm -hmm. uh, because it is important in spirituality whatever spirituality that you have, your spirituality stands or falls with authenticity and integrity. Right. Um, so that, you know, that needs to be still the core. Um, they, they will, I think what's most important, and then I'll finish and let you ask another question. <laughs> no, no, no. What, what is also very important is I think that in personal conversations, in one-to-one in, in -one conversations, um, it is about, sometimes about offering language. It is about um, searching for where is your spirituality much more than we used to do. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned this question of integrity, and I'm sorry it's gotten dark on me. The lights have automatically turned off, so. <laughs> um, Time to go home, Michael. Yeah, it's, it's not even five o'clock yet. Um, <laughs> the, the question of integrity is so interesting because even as we're looking at declining uh, rates of religious affiliation in the U.S., still, of course, most chaplains are going to uh, identify with some specific tradition, and, and I don't know the exact breakdown of, of what the, the general uh, profession looks like, but they are coming out of a, a religious tradition, working with a, uh, a very diverse um, uh, community of patients, clients, in whatever setting they're in. To my knowledge, the, if, if we think about chaplains who would identify as humanists, there aren't that many training opportunities or education opportunities for those folks here in the U.S. So in almost every instance, even if you were working with someone who would describe themselves as secular or a humanist or non-religious or whatever, the chaplain themselves is going to be uh, from sort of tradition, from some sort of tradition. From what, you know, I know I've just said we can't compare where you are with the United States in any meaningful way, but from your experience, what is sort of the, the, some sort of guideline or, or, you know, rules to keep in mind for how to engage with these audiences that, that are growing, but maybe chaplains have not been trained to work with in their time in seminary or whatever? Very true. Um, I think there are several levels. Uh, first of all, I think for your personal um, integrity and authenticity, it, it, uh, you need to do some inner spiritual and theological work if you're from a faith tradition, if you belong to a faith tradition. And for me, um, what was very important is the, the, the theology that um, God is, is present in all things and in everyone. So for me, that helped as, um, as a, a chaplain from a particular religious tradition to open myself for people who say they are secular, don't believe in God, um, and so on. Not that I want to label them as, you know, what Karel Rahner said, um, 
hidden, hidden faithful or something. I don't know how to translate it in English, but um, I don't want to label them as Christians and they don't know that they're Christians. That's what right. I meant. Right. You know, right. but, but what I do believe is that even if they don't believe in God, that they are important to God, therefore they are important to me. Mm. Um, just the way they are, so I respect them. That means also that maybe sometimes I, on a practical level, I can't help them. I can't support them um, because they might ask something for me from me that I can't give them, or they don't want something from me that I'm knowingly or unknowingly giving them. So it, it's it's all about boundaries, also. Yeah. But um, I I think that. Um, as you said before, it's not because you say you're secular or you don't believe in God that the attention, the attention for meaning of life has gone. If that is gone, then I would be afraid. <laughs> right. But I mean, then no, oh, I don't want to <laughs> even think about that. But and, and, and so I think for me, the basic or the main concern then is how you know how is this person giving meaning or receiving meaning or searching for meaning or experiencing meaninglessness in life because of what he or she is encountering how does she or he give meaning to the facts that are happening or can't give meaning to the facts that are happening and that is then i think my first concern and my mm -hmm. first task and that's exactly how, because I'm teaching spiritual care to um, students in medicines and physiotherapy mm. and um, pharmacology and, and such. Um, that's how I start by, you know, by making them aware that spiritual care is about everyone because everyone is searching for meaning and everyone wants to lead a meaningful life. And um, whether you do generalist spiritual care or specialist spiritual care, this is your common ground. Uh, for us as humans, whether we belong to a faith tradition or not. Right. Um, and so this would be my approach, you know, the, the meaning of life and, and see how a person is, is expressing that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's my cat. He's hungry. And he's very verbal, but it's okay. Who doesn't like a late night snack? I know I do. Um, this, the, the, what you mentioned about the integrity of the chaplain, and sometimes you're in these situations where you feel like you cannot give a patient what they are asking for. Uh, this is a growing field of research in the, I know, at least in the U.S., of moral distress among chaplains. Um, you know, on the one hand, the urge to do whatever it is that the patient needs, but on the other hand, feeling that, uh, you know, my, my framework would not permit me to do that in good conscience, which creates um, a real problem. That is a growing field of research, but there are also many other areas in which chaplaincy research is growing, and so that's a, this, this gives us a nice segue. How did you end up doing this. Uh, chaplaincy research, of course, has been around for a long time, but only fairly recently has it really exploded in, uh, in productivity and people who would identify themselves as researchers. So how did you end up doing this? Um, because I was curious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's the best reason to start research. Um, I, I always wanted to explore more, learn more, and um, that's the best way to start doing it. And um, I, I remember starting in St. Louis and Art Lucas, who was the head chaplain then, said, well, you know, I will give you some, you know, some patient floors, but what do you want to do next to it? You can, you know, train people or you can do some research or you can, you know, do some uh, digging into um, the team, you know, work with the CPE. And I was like, oh, what, what, what? and whatever I thought of next days was always turning out to be research. So that's, 
that's what I did. But I also found that doing research is just helping future generations of chaplaincy and also um, this generation of chaplains because there is a tremendous need again for a language um, about what we do and i'm not saying that everything can be measured um i think yeah. yeah i mean and the same goes for nursing and and for doctors they can't measure everything either um, so it's not about the measuring for me necessarily it's about um, being informed enough by what we have in common and mm. what we all do to provide the best possible spiritual care and the only way we we try to well until recently uh, let's say 20 30 years ago um, the only way we try to achieve the best possible spiritual care was through building our experience and um, by, you know, layering experience on experience so that uh, we would come to a kind of reflection process and a self-reflection process on the best spiritual uh, care. And now I think there is a new way to do that um, by being informed by research mm -hmm. that says that, you know, if, if you want to do the best possible spiritual care, well, this is what we found out. Um, and you can be inspired by it in your spiritual care practice. When you, when you mentioned that with all of the areas of medicine, physical, spiritual, uh, you can't measure everything. And what I immediately thought of was, I'm sure there is a version of it where you are, doctor's um, examination room, there's that little thing on the wall. It is a one to 10 scale with smiley faces, transitioning to frowny faces. How much pain are you in? Zero is none. 10 is, you know, the face is crying, but you'd be on the ground writhing in pain. Um, there's no version of that for spirituality. Uh, you can't, uh, a chaplain can't come in and you say, well, I'm at about a, you know, a six on the spiritual pains. I mean, I guess you could, but who knows what that actually means. With that in mind, though, what is a chaplaincy outcome if we can't measure it? Um, and of course, I know this is an enormous debate within the research community, so I'm not trying to jump in the middle of that. That would be deadly. Um, but if, if we can't quantify everything, um, then what do chaplaincy outcomes, what does that phrase even mean? Yeah, well, I think that we have to be aware that we are not divided in four parts. Um, you, you know, we, we can talk about the physical and the social and the emotional and spiritual, and those are four perspectives. But at the same time, we're, we're continuously uh, integrating all four of them in, inside of ourselves. They're continuously influencing uh, each other. And um, so one of the things that I'm convinced of is that the, the spiritual works through the, all the other stuff. So um, if you take, for example, and, and that's why every concept can have multiple layers. Um, so if you, for example, say, well, chaplaincy has an effect on anxiety. I do believe that. But I also do believe that a psychologist can have an effect on anxiety or a nurse or a doctor. So what is specific about chaplaincy then? I think it's not only one factor, but it's a, a, a multitude of factors. It's also your identity. It's um, the way you give attention. It's, it's, you know, it's a multitude of things. The fact that you're really listening to that aspect of life and not something else necessarily you're digging for that aspect it, right. it can be a multitude of things and we will always you know uh, fail in 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 uh, giving the whole picture but nobody will so right. it's that's not no reason to not try um and uh I think that we're on a good path. We will make errors, we will fail, uh, but we will also learn and continue. 
that being said, there's something else that I forgot to say, Michael, if I may. Of course. Um, I forgot something. And um, I just, when, when you said, you know, when people say they're secular and, and people say they don't believe in God, from our experience here, um, it's worth exploring that. Mm. Because there, there was a recent research into, which came up with interesting concepts like, for example, religious atheism or post uh, theism, mm -hmm. which, you know, is just showing that people still have um, that urge towards transcendence and um, still connect themselves in a transcendent way, uh, but are no longer filling that in with a personal God. Right. Um, so what, what we see here, for example, and I mean with here, I mean Western Europe. So that's three to four countries, right? Um, that we see that indeed the, the personal God of the, of the three main religions, Islam, uh, Christianity, um, and Jewism, that they, that the personal connotation of a personal God is losing ground mm -hmm. and that there is the name God stays, but it's no longer filled in. Um, it's, it's filled in with the experience of the transcendent mm. for which they don't always find words. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's, that's how they see it. They feel part of a wholeness that they call God and it calls them to responsibility for others and for the earth. Uh, but it's no longer um, a father who is in heaven. Right, right. Yes, well, it, so it, that's, it, that's what I wanted to say. If so. anything is, uh, is, is sort of similar to what we're experiencing here, that, that is surely it. Um, mm -hmm. plenty, mm -hmm. plenty of people would say exactly what you just did. Um, the, the, this notion of a personal God does not uh, obtain for lots of folks uh, or God at all, but they do feel this sense of transcendence and, and responsibility, right. uh, certainly right. beyond themselves. Right. Um, as we're yes. talking about research here, and, and I just mentioned outcomes, um, and asking you how you got into research, tell us a little bit about what your research agenda looks like, what interests you now, and what you hope the research field produces in the next, you know, in the foreseeable future. Um, I'm currently, because with the European Network for Healthcare Chaplains, I was a coordinator of that until 2016. And then afterwards, um, we decided to um, found a research institute for chaplains in healthcare, which is called ERIC, the mm -hmm. European Research Institute for Healthcare Chaplaincy. And I'm currently chairing that. And we received the grant two years ago, um, or is it, yeah, two years and a half ago for uh, doing the PROM spiritual care in several European countries. So my research agenda is predominantly <laughs> doing that. Um, and, and it's very interesting. Uh, we, we cooperate with Austin Snowden Mm -hmm. who is a professor in um, Edinburgh in Scotland in Napier University and uh, he helps us with the statistics of it all and um, we have uh, prom research going on in different countries with I think an interesting group to me and it's a first that we are researching them is the chaplains who part-time work in a hospital and part-time outside of the hospital mm. in primary care. So they take their expertise of hospital chaplaincy into the homes of people, um, working together with physicians, general physicians at home, practitioners at home, uh, with uh, home nurses mm -hmm. and so on. So it's no longer parish-based or uh, faith community-based, 
but it, you know, it's the expertise from institutions that comes to um, healthcare corporations outside of institutions. Sure. And so they are taking part in the prom spiritual care for the first time. So this is my, you know, my main thing other than that, I'm uh, especially busy with um, charting, documenting. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of my research areas. I'm uh, into more theological, well, I'm into generalist spiritual care. Uh, I also teach in ISPEC uh, with yeah. Christina Puhalski and others. Um, I try to take an approach there towards my students and you could call it research because I always ask them about the benefits and, and, and the disadvantages of that. I try to start with the meaning of life, try to teach them about spiritual care based upon general concepts like gratitude, um, evil and healing reconciliation, hope and despair, which can have a broader spiritual meaning, but can also have a specific religious meaning. And so I try to give them all layers of possibilities. Um, and then I think on my research agenda is also theological research into, for example, um, concepts like hope and shame uh, and gratitude. Um, what does it mean uh, in chaplaincy and what can we do with it? Right, right. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned your, your theological research and it, um, it brings me back to this question that came up a couple of minutes ago as you, were, as you were talking. And that is that in the United States, we know that there are um, growing numbers of places where chaplains can go and receive training as chaplains as part of their formal education, it's, you know, it, it's certainly not um, the standard paradigm for seminaries or theological schools, but it is growing. What does it look like to relate to the religious communities or institutions that they come from themselves? Um, I'm really interested in the relationship between chaplains and, um, you know, and their own congregations or other clergy within their tradition. I'm, I'm very in interested to know how they fit in to that, to that broader community. What is it like where you are? Are chaplains understood to be sort of, um, you know, for those that are clergy, are they, you know, the same as folks that are working in a congregation or is it a totally different world? Interesting question. Um, again, it depends from country to country. But um, in my country, um, Catholic chaplains, humanist chaplains, Protestant chaplains uh, still have a tie with their faith tradition in a sense that, that we call it a double binding. Um, you're hired and paid by the hospital, but you're sent to the hospital by your faith tradition. Um, you're not sent there to you know, convert or whatever, you're, you're sent there to professionally be a chaplain and respect the life and faith views of everyone that you visit. Um, there is, you know, there is an offer of continuous education out of the faith traditions. They work together with the academic centers who do the trainings. Um, there is supervision intervision that is offered by the faith traditions. Mm -hmm. So there is still a, a pretty close tie, but also, um, and you know, it's, it's not always easy, um, but yeah, <laughs> but um, is it different than, for example, people who live in congregate, who work in congregations? Yes, it is. Uh, it's less controlled. Um, sometimes it's less affirmed too. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> with one goes the other. Although we had a, well, Catholic chaplains now had a, a very good letter from the bishops. Um, so that, that's always a bonus. Um, I'm very happy with it. But um, around euthanasia, no less. But um, uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, I know that there are countries where the connection is not as strong anymore. Mm -hmm. And there are countries where the connection is even stronger. Um, so it's, it's, you know, 
there is a lot of understanding, I think, from both sides about each other's position. And on some levels, there is not. <laughs> sure, of course. Yeah. of course. I think it's pretty much the same. Uh, this, is a, this is a timely question that came in as we were just talking about research. Um, this is from someone, uh, I'm assuming, uh, Hannah, you're in Israel now. Uh, this question says, the four accredited CPE training programs in Israel are all based on faith care. Uh, while the chaplain comes from their own individual spiritual world, the training and field work is very focused on exploring the spiritual world of the patient or client with the idea of sitting as witness and assisting the patient or client to find and strengthen their own spiritual base. Um, exactly. The, the, I'm assuming that's, that's fairly in line with, with, what, yeah. with what the work that you do. Uh, but also, is your, is your research only healthcare oriented? Uh, is it also related to trauma care at all? Oh, um, well, maybe not the trauma that she's expecting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have a few, yes, I have a few research projects going on with students about post-traumatic care, but then in uh, situations of refugee camps and um, situations of, of post-war situations. Sure. Um, so international students who are coming from Sri Lanka or from South Sudan and are coming from horrible, horrible contexts, uh, wishing to work from the point of view of, of uh, spiritual care with those in camps or those who are victimized because of violence or war. And um, yes, so that's trauma oriented, but yeah. not in the way probably that she, she is uh, mentioned or she is meaning. Sure, sure. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my license to combine two questions because I think they're very closely related. One person says, are you, do you suggest that we continue, uh, I'm sorry, do, do you suggest that we discontinue using the title chaplain? And that's related to this other question. Um, what's the difference between a religious social worker and a secular, or the version that I usually ask is, what does a chaplain do that a social worker doesn't or can't? Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the answer that you would give is different from an answer than an American would give. So I'm very curious to know. I don't know about that. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see. But yes, I, I do prefer the, the name spiritual caregiver um, above chaplain. And um, I, you know, in my country, we chose for the name a spiritual caregiver because that could um, include spiritual caregivers from all faith traditions, also mm -hmm. humanist traditions, uh, because they are uncomfortable with the term chaplain, though oh. there are humanists who happily use the term humanist chaplain. It also depends on who the person is, but I can understand that very much. <laughs> um, so we, we choose for spiritual caregivers. Also because um, of the integration of spiritual care in palliative care and the fact that spiritual care is integrated in the, uh, in the language of, of palliative care and thus also in oncology and thus also in internal medicines because uh, palliative support teams are coming all over the or visiting people all over the hospital. So for us, you know, to um, connect with the term spiritual care. Also, the term spiritual care is used in WHO definitions. It's uh. used in, in research a lot. So we thought, you know, this, this to us is uh, the right name we want to go for, um, which doesn't mean that we uh, hide our own mm. identity because I think a patient has the right to know who is in front of him or her. Um, but spiritual caregiver to us is an ideal generalist name. Sure. Um, then, you know, what's the difference between a religious social worker and a secular, uh, <laughs> a secular um, chaplain? Well, the one is religious, the other is secular. <laughs> <laughs> apart, apart from that, I think that the professional uh, perspective is different. Um, I'm, you know, 
I, I, I can call myself a generalist social worker and a generalist nurse and a generalist doctor and a generalist physiotherapy in a sense that if I enter a room and a patient is lying down, is coughing so hard, that then I need to know that what I need to do first is, is relief on the physical level and not start a conversation about the spiritual, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, um, but my main point of view and my main competencies and my main antenna goes towards that spiritual dimension. Sure. And um, that's not the case for the social worker. The social worker, the psychologist, it's like a room, a house with many rooms. And sometimes I enter through the room of the physical or the room of the how are you feeling or the room of the where are you at to end in the room of the spiritual and the meaning of life and, and the faith and everything is there. And sometimes a psychologist or a social worker will enter through the house through the room of the spiritual but needs to end up somewhere else. Right. Um, right. And so it's, it's kind of, well, I think if you want to um, formulate it in a, a more professional way, it's about the a primary and a secondary reference frame in your mm -hmm. profession. My primary reference frame is um, faith, spiritual uh, meaning of life. That's my primary reference frame. My secondary reference frame might be a more psychological one or a more social one, mm -hmm. uh, depending on my previous training or my interest. Um, but you can't say that the primary reference frame of a psychologist or a social worker is uh, spiritual care. Sure, sure. Well, and, and related to this, this notion of role and, and what it is that you actually do with a patient, this, this question is great because it's, uh, I think within, um, we're speaking, uh, uh, both of us out of the Catholic tradition, so it's going to be, it's, this is a familiar question, but what is the difference between a spiritual caregiver and a spiritual director in terms of the methods that are used in spiritual care? And of course, I think that maybe that's more appropriate for, for longer relationships of care. Still, in either case, what's the difference? Yeah. Um, well, I think there are some differences. Um, in a sense that the method used in spiritual direction is different than the one used in spiritual care. Um, I, and, and also indeed, I think spiritual direction is a much longer tragic that you need to go. Um, then, and it's also within a certain faith tradition uh, that you do this where a patient is identifying clearly with a certain faith tradition and you use all the tools of that for faith mm -hmm. tradition um, to help discover the patient how god is present in his or her life and how to discern what god wants from you in your life what's what's god calling for you uh, while i think with a patient it's always related to one particular um time of suffering sure. uh, that, and you you encounter often you encounter patients in the midst of suffering there where there is meaning taken away and it becomes different difficult to see meaning in life um, it often becomes different to see traces of god in life um, so it, it's a totally different context that you're working in and mostly a short for many of us at least right. if you're working in acute hospitals um, it's it's a very short period of time right. to go to the essence of what is happening there because of the circumstances hmm. so i think you know in a sense that yes you are a guide um, in one way you're a, a barrier of or a carrier of stories um, you are someone who tries to seek together with the patient where the holy and the sacred is in his or her life. Uh, but I think the context, the method, and the time frame is very different. Sure, sure. As we get to the, to the, the top of the hour here, where it is very late for you, I don't want to go over certainly, but taking into account the, the vast uh, the variety of settings that you have worked in. And in some ways, you have seen it all. 
Um, so with that in mind, what is your advice to, to chaplains? Most of, our, most of our audience is American chaplains. Um, from, from your standpoint, what do they need to know to provide the best spiritual care? Well, first of all, I want to say you haven't seen me on my best. I mean, normally I look better than this in the morning. But nevertheless, um, apart from that, there are two things that I want to say. First of all, I want to say that um, the best job in the world is chaplaincy. And um, it's, I, I have a tremendous respect um, and admiration for everyone who does it day in, day out. Um, I would advise you to regularly take a breath and see what the amount of suffering is doing to you. Mm. Um, um, and and that's, that's, I really mean that. And uh, second of all, to provide the best possible spiritual care is first of all, to continue to educate yourself, uh, read, listen, hear, um, see that chaplaincy is done all over the world, learn from that, broaden your horizon. It's, what, uh, it's one of my favorite theological books of all times, so, you know, Widening the Horizons. The title is very inspiring uh, by, by Charles Gherkin. Um, and I, I think that, you know, treasure the stories that you hear, carry them with you, and um, you're in a greenhouse of spirituality. And this is something that you can benefit from tremendously, not only for yourself, but for everyone who is in your care. But I would, I would strongly suggest to keep being curious, learn, um, work with others, and um, teach others to do spiritual care. That's the only way to get to the best possible spiritual yeah. care, if it's you know, um, shared with many. Sure, sure. Well, thank you again so much for your time. Um, I will remind everyone that these are recorded. It'll be up on our website in the next couple of days, uh, maybe up to a week. It just depends on, on, uh, on when we get the files and so on. Um, but we very much appreciate your perspective and your experience. This is a wonderful, uh, just a wonderful look into, into how chaplaincy is done elsewhere and how it's different and how it's uh, similar as well. So Thank you very much for your time. And thank you, everybody, for spending uh, the afternoon with us. I will look forward to seeing everyone again soon. And it's always a pleasure.